Hey everybody, this is the audio record room where we record audio for Market to Market and various programs here at Iowa PBS. And uh, we are going to go down the hall. This is a, uh, see we even get the red light on to say that we're on the air. Uh, hi, I'm Paul Yeager. This is the M2M podcast. And we normally do the recording in this room here, but we have been recording a lot of things remotely. And that's what we did this week as we have uh, Emily Kreckelberg, and we're going to be talking about mental health today, and this is a topic we've discussed before, and we are going to be doing more on, so please uh, keep an eye on the podcast feed as well as our social media channels as we update uh, a special that is coming your way here about uh, mental health, or at least uh, some stories and, and possibly some more, so we'll give you those details. What we're going to talk about today is uh, her life, both uh, on and off her clock hours as she has some personal stories to share from her life growing up on a Minnesota dairy farm, but what her professional life is with the University of Minnesota Extension. So we'll be talking about physical health as well as mental health in this special video edition of the M2M podcast. Again, a production of Iowa PBS and the Market to Market TV show. So enjoy this one if you want uh, video wise, or you can just download it, listen, and uh, we'll get you caught up here and we'll see you on the other side. But now our conversation. Emily, you're not new to extension, but you're in a different position. You're sitting uh, in near the cities right now, right? Yeah, so I'm currently in Coon Rapids, which is a uh, suburb of Minneapolis. So it's on the northwest side of the metro. I'm actually uh, staying with some relatives right now. It was supposed to be temporary. And then we got our stay at home orders in Minnesota and all of that. So I have been here uh, for about two months now. What are you? Na are you close to home, like your native area? Um, not, not particularly. No. So I grew up on a dairy farm uh, down by Lesueur, Minnesota, which is kind of near Mankato. Uh, so that's south central part of the state. So, grew up at a dairy farm. Did you have any interest in being on the dairy farm growing up? I had an interest in dairy, not necessarily in dairy farming. Um, but I mean, cows are my favorite animal. I've just always loved farming and cows and dairying and the whole agriculture way of life. Um, so I really thought uh, that I wanted to work with cows and um, I knew I didn't want to be a vet. So I thought I would become a ruminant nutritionist. And then I went to college at the University of Minnesota and took ruminant nutrition class. And after about two weeks, I said to myself, I do not want to be a ruminant nutritionist anymore. Um, so then during my time in college, I actually had the opportunity to intern with University of Minnesota Extension. And I came back to campus and I said, I found my dream job. Like Extension is it for me. And while I do love cows and animals and, and working with them, uh, my passion really lies with farmers and working with them. And Extension has allowed me to do that. You, you, you do get to get out and about. So is anybody on the family still on the farm there uh, near Lesueur? Yeah, so uh, my dad actually sold our dairy cows almost two years ago to the day. Um, but my brother is still there farming the land and he raises some uh, beef steers and, and does uh, direct marketing with those. And then I have another brother who dairy farms over in the Faribault, Minnesota area. So if anybody needs a hand, they can hire, they can, if you go visit them, they, what if you would have been stuck there for two weeks or two months? You would have been doing chores every day. Uh, probably. And, and you know what, that's okay. Uh, I will admit that since I am still connected to farming and, and we of course are um, an essential industry still, I have been uh, pulled in to, to do some milking and some farming things, uh, here and there, just as you know, we got to still get the work done. Cows still need to be milked. So went to the University of Minnesota. Uh, and now with extension, I think you said a few years, what uh, you say extension really offers a lot of what you like, what is it that you like? I mean, every state is somewhat similar when it comes to extension. What's special about the Minnesota extension experience? Yeah, well, I spent the first um, almost seven years of my career with Extension as a local livestock educator. So I was uh, county-based. I had a three-county area in the central part of Minnesota, Stearns, Benton, and Morrison. And that is dairy country. 
uh, in the state. And so because I was a dairy background, being the livestock educator up there was a perfect fit because it was a lot of dairy work, which I loved. But in addition to that, I have always had a really big passion for farm safety and health. So uh, one thing that I haven't shared yet about my family is actually two of my family members, my dad um, and the brother that's uh, farming our homeland now, have both lost their limbs in agricultural accidents. And started, uh, my dad lost his leg in an accident with um, a feed conveyor auger when he was 19, so I wasn't alive yet, uh, but my brother lost his arm pretty similarly um, in some machinery with an auger. Uh, three and a half years ago. And so I was around for that. And it just uh, was a really hard thing for him, for our family. And like I said, I had always been interested and passionate about farm safety. And then after that, and just seeing the impacts that it has, uh, that really solidified for me that, you know, this is what I want to do. This is what I care about. And I you know, what I tell people, my charge is I don't want any more families to get the phone call I had to get. Like you said, the one thing with your dad, you didn't know, but your brother, you did. And if that's three and a half years, that's right in the middle of your career. Mm -hmm. Um, So you had your dad's message, the the real story that, did you talk about it uh, to people? Um, Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's also been a really cool thing about doing this work is being able to share my story and and my family's story. And, you know, my dad and brother, I mean, all my siblings and parents, I mean, they know what I talk about and and why I'm doing it. And they have no problem with me, you know, sharing about our family and and our trials and tribulations along the way, Uh, you know, because that too is just I think so important and, and, you know, you know, this in media storytelling is just such a great teacher, I think. And so I love being able to teach people uh, by sharing my story, by sharing my family's story. And it has really given me, I mean, the insider look at farm accidents, um, farm stress, the impacts of selling a dairy herd on mental health, all of those things. It's not just, I'm somebody who cares about it and wants to talk about it. Um, I'm somebody who's lived it right along with these people. And that's part of why I am so passionate about wanting to help them. I'm not going to say it's an easy thing to talk about, but which one is easier to get an audience's attention? Uh, Is it about the physical incident or the mental incident that, that, that farmers deal with? Um, You know, that's tough because I, you know, like I said, I really like to tell stories and I have a lot of them um, on both sides. I think that, you know, the physical um, side is something that a lot of people can relate to. I think we all know somebody or have a parent or grandparent or a neighbor that at the very least, although I feel weird saying that, is, you know, missing some fingers or something. Right. So so that is very relatable for a lot of people, and, and they have lived that experience a lot too. But then it does allow me to kind of open up the conversation about, you know, the mental health side of that and the stress side of that and what that means. Um, you know, these, these are catastrophic accidents in, in some cases. I mean, filed as such with OSHA. So... It's not just, a, oh, this happened and now it's back to usual. Um, you know, there's an adjustment period and things will change and be different. And so it is, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about, but, you know, for me, it's so, so important. And so I don't mind doing it. It's in the physical side of things, um, it, it's easier to grab their attention. But the mental, nobody wants to talk about. Uh, a mental thing, let alone a farmer. I mean, you know, I know they're guarded, they're stayed, they're stoic, they're whatever, you know, that's the stereotype that we have. Is that pretty accurate? Um, I would say yes and no. I think it's, you know, this combination of, right, it's uncomfortable because there's all the stigma around it. And so we are, you know, in a sense, kind of scared. It takes a big, big amount of courage um, and bravery to be vulnerable to people. But I have found that once people can find some common grounds um, or feel like they're not alone, they're much more willing to talk 
Uh, so for example, I myself uh, suffer from some mental illness. Um, so I have anxiety and depression, um, history of self-injury as well. Uh, so I take medication, go to therapy, do some other things to, to make sure I'm well. And I have just found that even though I, I'm not a farmer, of course, I share about my farming background, just sharing my story, it makes people realize like, wow. Um, and, and something they say to me so often, they'll go, well, I would have had no idea if you wouldn't have said anything. And that is just what sticks with me because I'm like, for most people, that's the point. Um, we don't want people to know. And, and so when people say, oh, I would have had no idea, part of me is like, good, I did my job. But another part is, you know, kind of sad because people should know. It shouldn't be this big secret. Um, you know, I get it's a sensitive topic, but like I said, I have found that once I share my story, I mean, every time I have, um, you know, talked to a crowd or given a presentation about farm stress, shared my own story with mental health and mental illness, at least one person will come up to me um, and share you know, they have depression or, you know, have been to therapy in the past or whatever it might be, um, you know, and so it is really incredible just how many people are impacted by this. And we just don't realize that. And, and I remember uh, one of my first farm stress programs I did and I had the evaluation and I asked people, like, what was your main takeaway from today? And the most common answer was, I'm not alone or there are other people that feel like this. And so I think that's the most important part of this. That's been the biggest takeaway for me is just reminding people that they are not in this alone and that there is somebody who understands. And I would imagine anytime you getting a, a group of two dozen, four dozen, six dozen, for the one that stops, there's probably four or five that are maybe looking around, don't want their neighbors to see them go up and, and talk to you. And if you stay around at a meeting long enough, you know that there'll be people that, that talk to yeah. you. Oh, yeah. That's what I always do is I talk and then I go, you know, stand in the back of the room or, you know, out in the hallway. And so people can come talk to me or people reach out to me after the fact. I always give out my email and my cell phone number so people can email me, they can text me. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot. And I'm sure some people think that I'm crazy for doing that and think, why would you want all these people contacting you? But more often than not, they just, you know, want to send one or two quick messages. And I thank them for sharing with me. Mm -hmm. That's it. I, you know, they just need to get it off their chest. Yeah. Um, and, and that is such a huge thing to have. And so I am honored uh, that people would entrust me with that role. What's your education been like in looking at past traumatic, let's talk mental health problems of what came out of the 1980s? I mean, what's taught to you versus what you've been able to pull from some people? I mean, how has the industry changed of what you're doing uh, when it comes to some of those challenges that farmers are facing on a mental health side? Yeah, I would say especially when we talk about the 80s, and I know that there were services available and outreach and all of those things. And I, I will admit, I um, was not alive in the 80s. I was born in 1990. That's why I asked about the education. It's okay. It's all right. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I don't have lived experience on that one. But of course, yeah, I've talked to a lot of people and kind of done my research on that. And I just think too, with that, we are still doing that outreach. I think there's more outreach. People are more willing to talk about it. Um, mental health advocacy has come a really long way. I personally still think it has a long way to go, but I just think of five years ago, 10 years ago, how different it looks now and, and how much more willing people, you know, are to talk about it. And, and they realize, I think a lot of them, it's like once, once you say it once, it just is easier and easier to say it again and again. One other thing that I think makes this different than the 80s is all of the technology that we have, which I think also makes it easier because help and resources are accessible in ways that they weren't before. And like you've said, oh, people maybe don't want to, you know, have their neighbors see them come up and talk to me after a meeting. Well, like I said, now they can email me or text me after. Mm -hmm. So no one needs to know. Or I know uh, for, for myself, 
um, you know, I have looked up and, and done a lot of reading and, and gotten some ideas uh, for therapies and things like that just by, you know, looking myself, looking it up online, or I follow a lot of social media accounts from organizations that work in mental health. And so these things that we just didn't have in the 80s. And so I do feel like we are moving more towards normalizing mental health care and, and discussing mental health. Uh, because it is it is a part of us, whether whether we want it to be or not, uh, and so I think that that's been a big part of it. You bring up social media, and I wanted to ask you about Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Some people put on a pretty good show, and there's other people who will then come and say, "I have put on a good show for all of you, but let's face it, I am broken, and I'm admitting it." Does that help when somebody does that? It does. And, and as somebody who has done that, um, you know, if you follow me on social media, especially Twitter or Instagram, yeah, we all like to show the highlight reel and how great our lives are. Um, but there is something so poignant about somebody who goes, you know what, this is not the whole story. And, and this is the part of the story you're missing. And so as, as somebody who's viewing that and consuming that, it, it does make a big difference because we are, are creatures of comparison. And I would too, I try very hard not to, but we love to compare. And so I think it's so easy for us to look at people's social media and think they got it all figured out, their life's all on track. And we have no idea what's going on behind the scenes. And I think, and then for me, being able to share my own story in that way of just going, hey, here's what's going on. Uh, and, and just recently, I've really dived into that. I, I recently went through a divorce, sold my house. I, I live with my relatives because I'm technically homeless right now. And now we're working from home and all of this. Uh, and so, yeah, I just kind of put it out there for people. And like, this is what's been going on with me. Uh, you know, and, and again, we got the, I had no idea. And I said, that's why I shared it. Mm -hmm. people need to know that you know that I don't think anybody thought I was perfect but just in case (laughs) just the reminder that I'm not um, (laughs) that was important and yeah again it's like it helps other people because then they go you know yeah I went through a divorce too or yeah I'm going through this or I'm really struggling with this you know COVID-19 stuff too and so it is such a great way to to reach out and connect in a different way are you fine as a society? Are we fine that we've taken down some of those walls um, and we are more free to share? Um, is it a generational thing where we're more free to share? If I'm under 40, am I more willing to share than somebody over 40? Have you found anything like that? Those old dudes like me compared to you? You know, I actually get that question a lot because people always ask me, oh, the ones that come up to you after programs, they must all be young, and, you know, millennials or Gen Xers or what have you. And honestly, of the people that come up and talk to me face to face, highest majority of them would be men 60 plus easily. Uh, and so I, I don't know that it's a generational thing. I think it is a societal thing that it is becoming more normal. I mean, there are still people that are uncomfortable by it, or I know this was, this was something that I struggled with, just not having a full grasp, um, really understanding, you know, mental health and mental illness and that they are different. Um, you know, they're, they're not the same thing. They don't even exist on a spectrum where it's like, oh, if you're, you're either mentally healthy or you have mental illness, uh, that's not how it works. And so, I think we're still working on some of that education piece. People do seem to be getting more open to it. And like I already said, I think we still have some work to do on that front, but we are seeing progress. And I think that's really cool. I'm not going to ask you to diagnose everybody, but what are we, are are we seeing a certain more diagnoses of depression or anxiety or realization of, you know, I'm just not right uh, too many days in a row? Or is there a certain commonality that people have? Or are we just like what we think we are? We are all different. Well, um, I would say yes to everything you just said. 
Um, and, and no, I am not a practicing clinician, so I'm not a true mental health professional, so I'm not going to diagnose. But I will say, um, you know, in times like this, yes, we are seeing high levels of stress and in a lot of people, some increased anxiety and or depression symptoms. So maybe not necessarily the diagnosed illness, but symptoms um, of those cases are possible. And, and something else that, you know, again, I'm not trying to be um, uh, an armchair, uh, you know, psychologist here, but in a part of my diagnosis, I also have something that's called adjustment disorder, um, just as I've been going through big life changes and all of that. And I have found that kind of kicking in again uh, with some of this COVID-19 stuff. And adjustment disorder is, you know, typically considered a, a temporary problem. So you do experience depression, anxiety, um, some other issues with it, but it's, you know, while you're in this adjustment phase. And so I wouldn't be surprised if other people were suffering from that or had that right now. I think, yeah, anxiety is probably the biggest one and just general stress um, is huge right now. And and we need to remember that we all experience this differently. We all cope with it differently. Um, I would say, personally, I think I'm coping with COVID-19 pretty well, just because heading into this, everything in my life was flipped upside down anyways. So I was like, eh, one more thing. I got this. I'm fine. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it, there are days that are tougher than others. Absolutely. Um, but... Yeah, and so I think we also need to be cognizant and respectful of the fact that there are people that are doing just fine, and that's because they're resilient, and there are people that are not doing fine, and that's okay, too, because we all absorb these things and process these things and react to these things differently. All right, so right now I've got a whole bunch of people that are out, they're planting corn, they're planting soybeans, they're in the field, they're doing what they love to do. They, it's, they've been cooped up all winter. Maybe they haven't seen that the markets have fallen off the table or, but you know, certain things economically, that's a major stress for someone right now. What is, a? am not saying again, a blanket policy for anything, but what are some ways I can try to relax, find uh, some comfort, find some help in, in knowing that I have a bank loan due. I've got a note I've got to pay. I am upside down on this. If this doesn't happen, it's more than just breathing and, and relaxing. What are some, what do I do? Yeah. So that is such a great point, Paul. And we were seeing all of these stressors before, and then I kind of feel like COVID-19 came along and was this beautiful little cherry on top to this whole disaster. Um, <laughs> but I, the thing I always encourage people to think about is what is actually in my control? And I know that's hard because that's the thing that's causing us the most stress or anxiety or depression mm -hmm. or whatever it might be is all of these things that are outside of our control. And it's driving us crazy because it's like, what can I do? It's out of my control. Uh, but we can control ourselves. And, you know, that sounds almost oversimplified, I think. But that's the fact of the matter. And the things we really control with ourselves are, you know, our thoughts and our emotions and the way that we communicate with other people. And so some of those things that you did mention, uh, you know, deep breathing, relaxation, reflection, meditation, um, praying, whatever it might be, those things are still good, still do those. Uh, but I also really encourage people to communicate. I think a lot of us, and I think in agriculture and farming, it's very common that we, like you said, farmers are very stoic. I'm going to hold it in just going to dig my heels in, pull myself up by my bootstraps. I got this. Um, you, you just can't keep it all in. You just can't. Right. <laughs> and so I think, you know, those things that you are concerned about or stressed about, whether it's with, you know, your, your operating loan or, uh, you know, whatever might be getting seed in the ground, you know, there's so many things, right. And just telling people, and that can be your spouse, that can be, a sibling, a parent, some other family member, a friend, um, you know, a, a leader in your faith community, 
even a, a mental health professional, a counselor, a therapist, just talking to somebody and, and being able to kind of examine what's going on through somebody's eyes, somebody else's eyes is really helpful. And even just as you lay it out there, you can kind of look at it to, you know, figuratively speaking and think, okay, like this is really what's happening or really what I'm thinking mm. about. Um, and, you know, it's, it sounds a little silly, I know, and I feel silly saying it, but I really think that that is the key. And we just need to do a good job of making sure we're expressing ourselves and talking about how we're feeling and really thinking about what thoughts are causing our emotions. Uh, this all kind of ties back to cognitive behavioral therapy. And it's this idea that, you know, everything is really caused by a thought and that thought is still coming from us. And so if we can identify what that thought is that's causing whatever response we're having, um, how can we change that thought? And so that our response can be more positive or at least less stress inducing. Emily, you bring up a whole bunch of stuff that, yeah, I'd love to unpack. Uh, one of the items that someone told me um, recently, I, I asked about, it was at a meeting s similar, I'm sure that you have, would have presented at, uh, just move it to a different state. Um, she said that, think about the chemical dealer or the input dealer that comes to visit on a farmer. Talk to them. Or... I said, well, what about training those people? Because when you're coming into the driveway to sell you something, it is, sales is about relationships. Yeah. If you notice that something is different about that person that you've called on for 10 years, five years, or you know well, what should I do if I'm one of those people? Yeah, that is such a great point. And I... I have done a lot of training with aid professionals. So people who go to farms and work with farmers on this topic and, and yeah, what do you do if you're concerned? What do you say? You know, how do you open it up? And everybody's different. And, you know, we are from the Midwest. And so we love the phrase, I'm fine. <laughs> are you okay? I'm fine. Is it ever fine when somebody yeah. says I'm fine? No, no. And so I encourage people, you know, reach out, ask questions. Um, the the way I kind of recommend it, and and these are based off some conversation starters from uh, MentalHealth.gov. So put together through the CDC, and it's you know kind of what I call a statement of concern and then a question. So just saying something like, you know, somebody who cares and wants to listen. So what do you want me to know about how you've been feeling? And, you know, with those questions, if the person isn't comfortable and wants to, you know, sidestep it and move along, that's fine. I would say two things. One, know that the person heard you and knew what you were doing in a good way. And two, um, nothing is stopping you from asking them again. So I tell people, be persistent. Don't be pushy, but, you know, follow up with them a week later and go, hey, you know, just want to let you know, uh, still been thinking about you, you know, anything you want to talk about, just things like that. Because um, I know when I was, you know, suffering from some mental health problems, it took people reaching out several times for me to finally be like, okay, I have to do something. I need to tell people what's going on. And so that is the biggest thing I can say and just really... You don't want to be accusatory or you really, really want to avoid um, questions that end with, are you? So you're not depressed, are you? You're not going to do something dumb, are you? You're not going to kill yourself, are you? If you do that, you are basically begging the person to say no. Uh, so I would say just really be cognizant of you know, questions not being super accusatory or confrontational, but just opening up, opening up, you know, a safe, a safe place for people to talk. And for most people, just that acknowledgement that somebody recognizes that they're struggling can be a huge relief. All right, let's go three types of people here. I am the quiet, reserved 
don't want to talk to anybody. I am certainly not going to stop and talk to you at the meeting. I'm certainly not going to call you on your phone. How do I get help? If I know something's not right, I know something's not right. So how, what do I do? Yeah. yeah. Well, if you know something's not right, um, first of all, like, that's amazing. I mean, just the self-diagnosis. Self and I know I'm, I'm not trying to be flippant yeah. about it, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's like, you know, good for those people. And part of it is, like I said, just kind of takes a little bit of courage. Um, that if you are that person that is quiet and very reserved and doesn't want to say anything, I mean, just think of that one person in your support network that you trust. And also kind of decide, do I want to tell somebody that knows me well, or do I want to tell somebody who doesn't? Because sometimes for people, being anonymous is better. Um, and for others, they are much more comfortable talking to somebody they know. And so if you you know, think somebody I don't know is better, uh, there are hotlines I know in Iowa. Um, they have a great um, hotline set up uh, through Iowa State in Minnesota. We have the Farm and Rural Helpline. Uh, so that is, you know, connection 24-7 to, you know, some counseling, free, totally confidential, not anybody who knows you. If you would rather talk to somebody who does know you, you know, just speaking up to a spouse, a family member, a friend, again, um, you know, clergy member, somebody in your faith community. I know a lot of farmers um, have, have told me that that's who they have leaned on um, are those types of people. And, and just saying, hey, I, I know something isn't right. Um, I'm not quite sure what I need to do next. Um, one thing that I would recommend is telling your doctor and you know, getting in your next appointment or physical, just going, hey, you know, I've kind of been feeling this way. And and in the medical profession, they do a much better job now of screening uh, for mental health issues. But I would say people like be honest with yourself and be honest with your provider about what's going on. And I know a lot of people have concerns about um, being put on medication. And I know that was a concern I had. And as somebody who was on medication, I would say, um, you know, it works for me. It doesn't work for everybody, but you can say that to your physician too. Like, Hey, this is what's going on. I'm really interested in trying some other options before medication. Uh, cause most health systems have their own, you know, counseling service or behavioral health service. Um, cause that's who I go to therapy through. It's through uh, the clinic I go to. And so there are options there. Um, but yeah, it's, you need to talk to somebody, uh, but you can certainly still do it in just in a discreet manner. You don't need to, you know, tweet out to the masses like yeah. I do, like, hey, I have depression. Uh, you know, that's a choice I make. Right. Uh, everybody needs to make that same choice. Everybody does it differently. All right. So I, I guess I, I'm going to ask now, I said three people, but you kind of answered two, the, the different ways. What if I know somebody who I think, but I know they're not going to open up to me? I might have to go two people around to get to them. They're not married or they're not connected. They're very recluse or, or withdrawn from a community. Let me use a different term there. Mm -hmm. um, if I know someone like that, that I, I am concerned about, but I know I can't get through. Well, first devil's advocate here, Paul, I would, I would argue against the, I know I can't get through. Um, <laughs> We, I think that, because uh, I know I've done this, it's more like I don't want to get through or I'm scared to, or I feel like I don't have time or I don't want to do it. Um, but I think, I mean, anybody can be that resource for anybody. Uh, you know, mental health and promoting mental health is everybody's responsibility and everybody can do it. And so with somebody like that, you know, you mentioned this isolation piece, which some of it is you know, just the nature of things. If they are, you know, single, don't have family, you know, and are out on a farm, of course, you know, with work hours and, and now the situation we're in currently with stay at home orders and everything, they're on their own. And so just think about ways that you can connect with them initially, just to get them some social connection. Um, because I find a lot that is the biggest issue is just people don't have any connection and getting that connection can be a huge help. So, you know, can you bring them dinner once a week? Mm -hmm. Can you 
just call them once a week. Or, you know, if you need to not necessarily lie, but make up like, oh, hey, can I come over and borrow X, Y, Z tool? You know, just something to get you over there, get you talking to that person, I think can be a huge help. But, you know, if you, like you say, Paul, if it is like you just can't get through to them, or maybe it's somebody that you know, but you're just not well enough acquainted with them that you can't call them on the phone and ask to borrow a tool. Certainly, yeah. Um, you know, reach out to others that you know may have more connections with them. And, you know, just kind of say, hey, I'm concerned about this person. This is what I've noticed. And again, it's just, you know, check on the person. You don't have to go there, like, ready to do a big intervention. You can just go, like I said, under some other other pretense. Of, hey, I just... I'm going to talk to you and and start to build some connection with you that way. Um, I know that that is actually something that I have, uh, you know, been a part of. Um, Got a call from somebody, they were concerned about a farmer, and then it was not somebody I knew particularly well, so I connected with a sales guy that I knew was a buddy of this farmer's um, from college, and, and so we were able to get that person help in that way. Um, So absolutely use your networks. And I know that for some of us, just doing this or having these conversations is hard. And you know what? Like, you don't have to do it alone. I know I just said, like, anybody can do it. And I do believe (laughs) that. But um, I understand that not everybody is, you know, a wild social extrovert like me. Right. Uh, (laughs) You can call me and I'll help you with it. Uh, So, yeah, don't, don't be afraid to call in the reinforcements. Just be a person. That's really what you're saying is just yeah. be human with each other. And mm-hmm. that can go a long way. Absolutely. All right. You talked about Minnesota and you talked about Iowa, but give me a, a real quick as we, for those that are maybe outside of those States, what are the type of groups I need to look for to help to, to that might be a number I can call? I mean, I think you said something about a rural network, a rural farm network type thing. Yeah. So the most kind of comprehensive listing of, Resources that you can find, especially if you're looking for a specific state, uh, would be from Farm Aid. So if you look up Farm Aid on their website, they have a great resource directory. Like I said, it's kind of, it's sorted by state. So if you go, hey, I'm in Michigan and I'm looking for some stuff, um, there you go. I would encourage people, um, almost, I think, almost every state uh, has cooperative extension through their land-grant university and Extension has been doing a lot of work in this area and a lot of response to this. So I would say also check in uh, with your state's Extension as well. Um, you know, there's a lot of things out there, but yeah, Farm Aid would be a comprehensive listing. Um, also, you can check with your state Department of Agriculture as well. All right. Emily, thank you so much for the time. I greatly appreciate you uh, sharing a lot of great insight and uh, and personal stories as well. And I hope it uh I hope it makes a a help with uh, at least one person, if not many, many more. Yeah, that's uh, why I get out of bed every morning. Honestly, I tell myself, if I can help one farmer today, then I did my job. So thank you so much for having me, Paul. Uh, It has been an honor. My thanks to Emily Kreckelberg from the University of Minnesota Extension for her conversation today about mental health. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback, email us, market to market at iowapbs.org, and we'll get those answered to you. Thanks for watching this video installment or listening. Glad to have you doing either. Share, tell a friend. We love it all. So uh, thanks for watching and have a good day.